Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning. We live. Everybody alive this morning? Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Wild eyed, bushy tail, ready to go. Right. Okay, well, good to see everybody this morning. Welcome to the Grace Minister Sunday School Live. We're going to do our Bible study. We'll go right into our prayer request this morning. Good to see everybody here. And like I say, you know, with a large group, we're not going to have time to mention every prayer request individually. So we just do it like a group uh, prayer request time. And with there is one special request I'd like to make known this morning. Uh, you know, Mickey Parnell, she was Myra Stevenson. You know, they were married. He passed away this past week with a heart attack. So let's remember that family in prayer. That's uh, Mickey Parnell and Myra. So let's remember that family in prayer this morning, passing of a loved one. Okay. Anybody having a prayer request upon the hearts this morning, just raise your hand. The Lord knows all about it. And like I said, just make it known in your prayer time. And just pray God to answer according to His precious will. And we always need to ask for grace to accept God's will or whatever it is. You know, a lot of times God don't answer prayer right away. Sometimes He don't answer the way we think He should. Sometimes we don't think He hears us at all. But He does hear us. He will answer according to His time and His purpose and His plan. Because we know God has a purpose for everything that takes place in our lives, no matter what it is. The good, the bad, and the ugly. So the next time you look in the mirror, don't feel too bad. God's got a plan. That's, a, that's the way I look at it. <laughs> so anyway, let's go to the throne of grace and ask God to bless our study, study time this morning. Heavenly Father, God, we do thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have to come, God, to the throne of grace and, God, to assemble ourselves together upon holy ground to worship you in the study of your precious word. God, we thank you for every soul that's here this morning. And God, I pray, Lord, they receive a blessing from coming this way. They are coming, Lord, with the intention and the desire to learn more about you through the study of your word. And God, I pray, Lord, you give us all a hunger and a thirst for your word, that we want to learn all we can, Lord, that we can live a victorious life and be faithful, effective witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, Lord, just continue to bless grace ministers and meet every need we have, Lord. And, God, you've seen the hands raised this morning. You know every need upon every heart. And, God, we just pray that your will be done knowing that you're going to do what's right at the appointed time. And God, we ask for grace to accept the answer to whatever it may be. And God, give us grace just to keep on keeping on, Lord, until you call us home, uh, until the rapture takes place. And Lord, bless this time of study. And we'll thank you and praise you for it, Lord, for us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, uh, has everybody got a notebook? You know, we give out notebooks <laughs> with all the study materials. Does everybody have a notebook? Okay. All right. Did everybody get the uh, study notes? You know, it's been two weeks since we've been in Sunday school. Does everybody have the study notes that we passed out last week? The two sheets on the resurrection? Is it about a needle copy? Yeah. Okay. Now these sheets that I'm giving out. We'll be on looking at page two, <coughs> two this morning. Because we'll go back and study page one in depth later. And we just read what scriptures are we studying in Sunday school for this period of time? Remember what book and chapter? Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter fifteen. Now what are we studying on in chapter fifteen? The importance of the resurrection. The importance of the resurrection. So like I say, that's why we're studying this, so you'll understand the importance. Everybody knows about the resurrection. You hear it preached, you hear it taught. And we just kind of take it at face value, but we never really studied and looked into it, the importance of it. Because as we said last week, without the resurrection, there would be no gospel, there would be no salvation, there would be no redemption. You'd still be dead and trespassing your sins, and then when you died, you'd die without hope. Your body would just whatever. So that's why we're studying. We're trying to get the importance of it. Now the sheet she's giving you out right now, some study notes I had, I just put them together and copied it off on the sheet. It kind of breaks down 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we looked at the last first two sections week before last. How many of you remember what we covered in those two sections? 
we're going to review just a short time, then we'll go to number three on this, but we're going to look at number one first so she finished giving out the sheets. So when you're studying this, like a, how many of you have been reading and studying on chapter 15 this week? Well, any week in the past. And I'll ask if you would to please read chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. Try to read it every day. Get familiar with it. So see, that's how you get familiar with Scripture and how you memorize and learn Scripture is rep repetition. repetition. You've got to read and reread and reread and reread. Read it every day. It doesn't take long. I know everybody has busy schedules. You have to make time to study. Study is hard work. It takes time. And a lot of people omit study because of that very reason. But it just takes too much more time. It's just too hard. I don't understand it. All right, let me ask you this. When you go to public school, when you did go, you go going to, to a community college or whatever now, did you understand everything the first day when you got your textbooks? No. no. How did you get to understand and learn? Study. By study. Cheat. Read it. You have homework in school. You go home and read, read the assigned lesson. Study. Read it. The Bible is the same way. God give us his word to study. Does anybody remember where that passage is in the Bible where God commands us to study? Anybody? Commands us to study. Yeah. All right, I'll give you the uh, book and chapter. See if you remember what the verse says. First Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman. Need is not to be ashamed, rightly divided in the word of truth. Good, John. <clears throat> See, because that's evidence of study. I don't know how many other people John sent a text to every morning about a Bible verse. But that man studies, he reads, he sends text messages every morning. I know one morning I got a text from him at quarter to five. <laughs> He's up there, buddy. <laughs> But see, he makes time. He works. He works a public job. He works long hours. He works long hours sometimes. But he makes time to study. Getting up. What time do you get up, John? 4.30? About 4, 4.30. About 4, 4.30. <laughs> do you think he's getting up at that time of day? Just, you know, I'm up there and I'm feeling good. I'm gone. He's getting up. He's making time to read and study. He works on job. He works every day. He works long hours. See, that's what study is all about. It's a sacrifice. You have to make time. If you wait to find time to study, you will never find it. And, and the less you study and don't make time, you're not going to have a desire to study. See, that's what we're trying to instill in you in the Sunday school class is give you a desire to want to learn. Because once you start learning, you're going to have a, a hunger and a thirst to want to know more. And anybody in here that's studying, you'll, you'll know that. The more you learn, the more you want to know. And so, see, that's what study is all about. You get a desire. And once you get that desire, you will make time. You're going to get up early. Or you may do it at night. After everything's over done with, you're going to have your devotion time before you go to bed. I'm not going to ask to show of hands of when you have your devotion time or when you read your Bible or read your Scripture. I just pray that you do. Will you read it early in the morning? You may have a Bible lunch break at work. Some people take the Bible to work and they read Scripture on a lunch break. Some people read it after work. Some people read it at night before they go to bed. But pick a time that's suitable to you, that works for you, that, you know, you won't feel pressure and you won't feel like you're just, you know, being pushed into it. Get a desire to read and to study and to learn. And find a time that suits your schedule. Everybody's not going to study the same way at the same time. But please, begin to develop a habit of study. Because you can read the Bible through every year. They have plans to read the Bible through every year. A lot of people do. But then you go back and ask them, well, what, what did that mean? What did you get out of it? And a lot of people really can't tell you. Well, I read the Bible through in a year. But what did they learn from it? Yeah, I read God's Word, but what did they... Are they growing and maturing in it? Are they learning what the Bible says to give them a victorious life and help them to live a successful life? So this is how you have victory in your life. How many of you had struggles this past week? If you're living and breathing, you had them. Because Satan showed his ugly head somewhere along the way. Tried to hinder you in some way or another. Tried to prevent something. Or 
trying to get you upset, trying to get you off track, or trying to lead you back into the addictions you may be struggling with or problems you be having. And so how do you deal with that? How do you, how do you, you know, survive that? You've got to go to God in prayer and read God's Word and He gives you scriptures. There's nothing you will go through in your life that you will not find in the Word of God. He tells you how to deal with it. He tells you how to handle it. And first of all, we got to turn to Him. Pray to Him and ask for strength and guidance and patience and, and uh, you know, whatever you need. God will give it to you. But that's why the Bible is so important. How many of you got your Bibles this morning? Has everybody got a Bible? I pray that everybody's got a Bible. The lady over there where I live, she's moving out. And she texted me yesterday. And she's got some Bibles she wants to give us the Grace Ministers. I don't know what kind they are, but I'll get them tomorrow. So if anybody needs a Bible, we'll have some next week. I may bring them to you tonight. So if you need a good Bible, I feel like some of these are good Bibles. So I'll bring them. So if anybody don't have a Bible, please get one. Okay, let's review what we looked at the week before last. First Corinthians chapter 15. And let's look, look on your uh, study sheet we'll give you this morning about the resurrection. Number one was the resurrection of Christ. His face reality. As we said, you know, we were studying, your faith is based on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And without that, you would have no faith. And the faith you have, it would be useless. Let's look at verses 1 and 2 real quick. I'm going to read it. First, First Corinthians 15, verses 1 and 2. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, and also you have received, and wherein you stand. First part of verse 2, by which also you are saved. All right, now look at that verse 1 again. There's three things I want you to look at on that. Paul said, which I preached. Now he preached, and they heard it. You got to hear the gospel. You got to hear the message. So he preached it, and they heard it. And the next thing is, is the necessity you got to receive it. They not only heard the gospel, but they received the gospel for the message of what it was. A lot of people hear the gospel, but they don't receive it. What are some of the reasons people don't receive the gospel? Not knowing exactly what it means. Yeah, not knowing what it means, but a lot of people are against God, against Christianity, against the Word. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to know anything about it. Because if they listen to it close enough, the Holy Spirit is going to convict their hearts, and then you've got to do something about it. A lot of people don't want to change their life. A lot of people say, well, I'll do it later. Have you ever witnessed anybody say, well, I'm not ready to get saved right now. i got a lot of living to do. I'm young, and I want to do this, and I'm going to do this. And then when I get older, you know, then I'll get saved. I thought about that one time a long time ago. For being young and, and just frisky, you've got a lot of things you want to do. so much out here to do, so many places to go, so many things to get involved in. You feel like you're missing fun. I'm not having any fun. I'm being left out. So a lot of people say, well, not now. I've had people tell me, well, I know I'm lost. I need to be saved, but I'm just not ready. I want to live my life, and then later on, I'll get saved. Some people do have an opportunity to do that, but a lot of people don't. Suppose they die in the, in, the, in the interval in between, I'll do it later, and then when they do it. A lot of people don't have that opportunity. They'll die before that opportunity ever comes, and they put it off and put it off and put it off. Just like a lot of people in addiction, and all, other sinful problems. You know, we just put it off, and you diddle-daddle, you're going to hang on to a little bit of this and a little bit of that, I can do both, and then, you know, maybe later on, I'll just completely be able to give it up, and then I'm going to surrender my life to Christ. Without a show of hands this morning, how many of you have really surrendered your life to Christ? Without show of hands. Because I don't want to embarrass anybody that don't raise their hand. But you just think about your own personal, look at your own personal life right now. Have you heard the true gospel? Did you receive it? And look at the last part of it. And stand in it. What, is, what does it mean, stand in the gospel? And that's where the King James words it, but other translations word it another way. You live by it. You live by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You heard it, you believed it, and you received it, and then you live by it. That's how you have victory in your life, no matter what's going on in your life. 
you get victory through the word of the Lord Jesus Christ where he tells you how to deal with it, what to do with it, and how he handles it and gives you the grace, the same the grace that you need. So, you know, that's why it's so important to study where you've got to hear the word, you've got to believe and receive the word. What is the salvation scripture we need so much on hearing and believing and receiving? You going to tell somebody the gospel message? I'll just give you the... Uh, book and chapter somebody can quote those two verses that's when i'm in the book of romans chapter 10 there's two verses we use all the time present the gospel of salvation to a message to a person all right verses 9 and 10 can anybody quote romans 10 9 and 10 <coughs> John, give everybody else a chance before you come in on it. <laughs> Can anybody, if you're going to present the gospel, if I'm lost and you're going to come to me and tell me I need to be saved, what scripture are you going to use to tell me that I'm lost and I need to be saved? What do I need to do? Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Everybody that's ever been saved and know the gospel should know those two scriptures because you use those two when you witness to a lost person. <clears throat> then, of course, you follow that with verse 13. Can anybody think for a minute? Turn to your Bibles. If you, you know you can't quote, just turn turn to Romans, chapter ten, verses nine and ten, and underline, circle, do whatever you have to to highlight it. Well, John, can you quote them? Not putting you on the spot, but. Uh, <laughs> that if thou shalt confess. Yeah, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. And believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. All right, what's the next verse? Verse 10. For, for with the heart, mouth, for with the mouth man confesses unto righteousness, and with the heart man believes unto salvation. That's it. See, that's the gospel message right there. <clears throat> that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, the resurrection chapter. You have got to have belief in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ or you'll never be saved. You cannot be saved apart from the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, and you've got those three words from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15, verse 1, where he preached, they heard it, they received it, and then they stand it. So Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if I shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thy heart, God has raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, not the mind, with the heart. For with the heart. You gotta be in the heart. You know, a lot of people are saved in their mind, but it's never been to their heart. How can you tell the difference between a person that's got mind salvation and heart salvation? Based by the way they live, the way they talk about Christianity, the way they use the Bible. Did you know you can have you can have mind salvation and die and go to hell? You can believe it all you want to. That's not going to save you. Believing is not enough. Paul says, I preach, you heard it, but then you received it. A lot of people hear the gospel. They know they're lost. They know to be saved. But they will not commit. They will not be saved. In their mind, they know they're lost. They know how to be saved. But it's never been to the heart. Never been in the heart. For with the heart, man believeth unto salvation. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So it's got to go from the mind to the heart. Let's see, I was trying to think of what book it's in. I'm not sure. Where the Bible says that the demons believed and trembled. See, saints, imps, the demons, they know who Jesus is. They believe it. They believe in trouble. But they will never say and never will be. See, believing is not enough. Well, I believe in Jesus. How many people you ever witnessed to? Well, I believe in God. How many people ever told you that? Yeah, I believe in the Bible. Yeah, I believe in going to church. But see, that doesn't say they can believe that all they want to. It's so sad there's going to be so many people in hell that has heard the gospel. They have understood it. They believe it in the mind. 
but it's never been to their heart. You see, that's why the Bible says, and I think in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, we're to examine ourselves whether ye be in the faith. See, that's what we need to do a lot. Have you ever done something since you've been saved and Satan's put it in your mind or the Holy Spirit's put it in your mind? If you were saved, you wouldn't do that. If you were saved, you wouldn't act like that. You wouldn't talk like that. You wouldn't go over here. And I've done things since I've been saved, ashamed of, not proud of, but I can testify to live in fact. I've done things that I know I shouldn't have done. I've been places where I shouldn't be. I've said things I shouldn't say. And then say to put in your mind, well, you ain't saved. Look how you act and look how you living and how you talk. Have you ever doubted your salvation? Mm -hmm. I have. I look at my life sometimes and I say, man, ain't no way in the world you can be saved and living like you live and doing what you're doing. And that's why the Holy Spirit convicts us and draws us and, and, does, and that's why you need to examine yourself. If you can call yourself a Christian and live like you're living and doing what you're doing and going where you're going and talking like you're doing, so you need to examine yourself, really. You need to examine yourself. Am I really saved? Am I really born again? Have I really heard the true gospel? Have I really received it? And am I, am I standing on the living in it? See, so many people think they're saved, but they never have been saved. See, that's why Paul says you examine yourself. How can you continue to live like you're living and saying that you're saved and born again? Look at your life. That tells you all you need to know. If you could live outside of God's will and outside of what the Bible teaches and feel comfortable and keep on and on and on, you know, that's, that's biblical proof you've never been saved. You can say I'm saved all you want to. You can come to the church. You can join the church. You can be baptized. But if your life does not change, the Bible says you have never been saved. You've never been. Because we're going to look at this in this process it's in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, I think it's verses 5 through 11, lays that very, very clear. Talking about the chastisement of God. God chastises his children. When he punishes us, he whips us, and we get out of line. Just like your earthly parents did, they punished you, or they corrected you in some way. God, is, as we as his earthly children, he does us the same way. And it tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, starting at verse 5, I think it's long down about verse 7 or maybe 8. The Bible says if you can, you know, he's talking about if you can sin and live like you're living, and if you're without chastisement, the King James Bible uses a strong word. He says if you're without chastisement, then you are bastards and not sons. In other words, you've never been saved. So you think about this. If you say you're saved and you've been born again and look at your life how you're living, if you're living good, good, and you know, if you've got a lot of things in that you need correcting, that's good. The Holy Spirit is showing it to you. But if you're knowing that and then you keep on and keep on and keep on, the Bible clearly tells you, hey, you ain't never been saved. If God does not chastise you, you are not saved no matter what you say, no matter what you've done. You are not. You've heard it. You actually received it in your mind, but maybe not in your heart. And you're not standing on it living in the world. You know, I don't know why the Lord's leading in this direction this morning so much, but I have to examine myself. I do. I mean, I'm a human being. My mind goes crazy sometimes. I think things I shouldn't think. I look at things I shouldn't look at. I talk about people when I shouldn't talk about. I mean, I'm going to be honest. How I many of you can relate to that? We all do. But the Holy Spirit will convict us and we have to repent of it and ask God to forgive us. And I've even been to people that don't even know that I've said something about them and I've told them. I said, look, I need to apologize to you. I need to ask you to forgive me. And I've done it. And I'll probably do it some more. And that's hard to do. But, you know, with the grace of God, you can do it. Okay, now, just look at the rest of that uh, chapter there, verses 3 and 4, you know, which that is the gospel. 
for are delivered unto you first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. See, that's the gospel right there. A lot of your gospel texts you read is going to have about Jesus' death, about his resurrection, about his burial. You can't get around the gospel message without the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you, you cannot do it. And this chapter emphasizes and focuses on to drive the point home. What makes us so sure that we are right? What makes us so sure that we know? But we won't laugh. We didn't see him die. We didn't see him buried. We didn't see him raised. But how do we know? I mean, how, how can we accept it? Yeah, I know he died on the cross. I know he was buried. I know he was raised from the dead. And I believe that, and I received it in my heart. And I'm, I'm doing the best I can. See, so Paul put these words in writing. What's a better evidence than the eyewitness accounts? See, a lot of these people in the Corinthian church, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't think about it. A lot of them, the Sadducees, were thinking that all flesh is evil. All material, materialistic things are evil. They think the body is evil. So when it dies, it just rots and decays and goes away. It don't rise. The flesh is evil. So they didn't believe in the resurrection. And then some of them believed in the resurrection, but they thought it was, you know, for them coming up, but not for the ones that already died. So they were, they were having a dilemma. That's why Paul wrote this chapter in this book to clarify the truth of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he gave the example of eyewitnesses. All right, look at the sheets you got where I give you on the resurrection. On sheet number two, everybody should have it. He, he, he lists some eyewitnesses out. But on this sheet, I went through the Bible with cross references. And you got 10, I think it's a 10 or the 9. It's a 10. 10 different accounts of eyewitnesses that saw the Lord Jesus Christ person to person, face to face, after he was raised from the dead. He even told them, you know, in the upper room one time, he appeared to them, you know, touch me, handle me. When they saw him, they were terrified. They thought he was a ghost. They thought he was a spirit. It just terrified him to death. Because he just. They went in a room like we all with the door shut and one was probably everything locked and all of a sudden there he stood. And he had a body. How did he get in there? He had a body. He had flesh and he said, touch me. I flesh and blood. Flesh and bone. Touch me. Feel me. Touch the hands. Uh, nail prints in my hands and told Thomas, touch me. Hey, I'm real. I'm a body. I've been resurrected. And so... See, that's that glorified body which we're going to look at in this study right here. The glorified body you're going to have. You're going to have a body just like the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to have flesh and bone just like he had with no restrictions. And I can't explain that. I've studied that. If you can't explain it. It drives you crazy, so you just have to get away from it. How did the body of Jesus just come right through, appear and disappear? Did he come through the wall or did he just appear and disappear? The scripture really doesn't explain it, and I can't explain it, but he did have a body. But you're going to have a body. And how do you, how do you know that you're going to have a body? See, Paul is driving this emphasis home that, flip, that materialistic flesh and bone is not evil itself, that God created it, he formed it in the Garden of Eden, and it's not evil. It's been redeemed after you've been saved and after the resurrection of the body at the rapture of the church, and when he comes back, the dead in Christ going to be raised first, then they're going to have a glorified body. And like if the Lord come today, everybody's in the grave right now that's dead, has been born again, they're going to rise first. Remember what I said about why have the dead got to rise first before the living? Remember what we said about that? They got the longest to go. They got six feet farther to go. So, you know, <laughs> they got to get a head start. <laughs> See, they're six feet more than us, so they got to get a head start. But anyway, the dead is going to be raised first. Then they're going to have a glorified body. And then instantly, we that are living right here now, we are born again to say when Christ comes back, this body is going to heaven, but it's going to be glorified. It's going to be changed. We're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Where's that resurrection scripture out about the bodies being changed in the resurrection? When, you know, most of you know it. A lot of you can quote it. Where is it at in the Bible? Where it says, you know, 
The dead gonna be raised first, and then we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the house, so shall we hear I will be with the Lord. I believe it's on uh, First Thessalonians chapter four. Bingo. Fifteen and sixteen. First Thessalonians chapter four, verses thirteen through eighteen. That's those scriptures. The dead are gonna be chained. Then we which are alive remain gonna be chained. We're, we're gonna get the glorified bodies that he's we're gonna talk about right here in chapter fifteen. See, so everything that the Bible teaches about salvation, about going to heaven, about living a victorious life, depends, falls completely on the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, get that sheet I gave you, this the one you got this morning. Let's look at that. This one right here with the two things side by side. All right, let's look at the right hand side. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 7. The standard by which every definition of the gospel must be measured. Everything in this Bible talks about the gospel must be measured by the standard of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because without that, there will be no gospel. There will be no faith. There will be no hope. So let's look at what the rest of it says right here. Okay, all right. It says, uh, it must include four elements. Number one, Christ's death. Number two, Christ's burial. Number three, Christ's resurrection. And look at number four. The testimony of the witnesses to the resurrection. See, so you have eyewitness accounts that testifies to the death, burial, and resurrection. A lot of them saw him die on the cross. Some of them buried him, literally took his body down and wrapped him in spices and buried him. They actually buried him themselves. And then they saw him after he was raised from the dead. They went to the tomb. We're going to cover those scriptures in, in the next couple of weeks. They went to the tomb. The women did because they were going to re-anoint his body with oils and spices because they didn't have time to do it because of the Sabbath weekend was setting in, so they couldn't do it from Thursday night until uh, Saturday. So they had to wait until after the Holy Days were celebrated. They couldn't do it during that time. That's why Christ had to die and take him down off the cross before six o'clock, because their day started at six o'clock. He had to die before six o'clock and had to be buried before then, or else they couldn't have done it. By Jewish law, they couldn't do anything between uh, that time from six that afternoon until six in the morning of the, on a Saturday before the resurrection. They couldn't do it. So that, that's why it was done at that time. All right, we look down at the other part of it. And it says, now because of this resurrection, it paves the way for witnesses. See, we witness for the Lord Jesus Christ by our life and by our testimony, by what we say and going out on visitation and doing. And it paves the way for that. Because, you know, we read, we'll probably review it next week, but Paul says, if Christ didn't raise from the dead, he said, then our preaching is in, is, is in vain, it's useless. It's no good. But we're going to look at that in a couple of, in a couple of times. It says, to pave the way for witnesses. Number one, it's the witness of the faithful. See, you can be a faithful witness because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, in other words, you're sure of what you're saying. You know that you believe the true gospel. You know you have the correct gospel message. And you can be sincere with it. You can be honest with it. And you know that you're presenting the truth. Because if you're not careful, it's going to happen more and more. That's why Sunday school is so important. Have you ever witnessed anybody and they turn it back on you? I mean, be honest. Have you ever witnessed anybody that try to turn it back on you? <clears throat> well, y'all believe the Bible. Why do you think the Bible is true? Well, why do you believe all this stuff? Well, we, we, we don't believe this part anymore. So how do you talk to people like that? When you go out and knock on doors, you don't know who you who going to come to the door. You don't know what they, who they're going to be. You don't know what they believe. You don't know what they're going to say. And so for being faithful to the gospel message, See, that's all you really need to know. You don't need to get into a deep theological discussion. You, 
you just let them know you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as God's Son. He sent him here to die by the sins, that he was buried, he rose again the third day, and he's sitting on the right hand of God on the throne, making intercession for us. I've been saved by the blood of Christ, which we studied in the book of Hebrews quite a bit, and we'll look at a couple of those later on too. But see, we can be a faithful witness. The faithful witness because we know we're right and we know we have the correct thing. And number two is the resurrection of the dead. See, we be a faithful witness because we can tell people, you know, about their loved ones that have already died that they will see them again. They will rise. They will have a glorified body just like we will. And we'll all be together in heaven. That's our hope. That, that's what we believe in and trust in, that we will be raised one of these days. And number three is the... Uh, Hope of eternal life. Because what did Paul say when we read the scriptures? I think in verses 12 through 19. He said, if there's no resurrection, he said, we, in that, we have no hope. And we are the Christians are the most pitiful people in the world. People need to feel sorry for us. Man, I still feel sorry for you. You bleed that mess. Man, man you, you pitiful. To believe in that and living on the hope on that. <coughs> See, that's what he was saying. We're the most people to be pitied. I mean, we're going in preaching and teaching the word of God and believing it and believe that Jesus died and buried and rose again. And we believe that stuff and we're, we're expanding upon it. We're being faithful and standing on that. I mean, we, we'd be looking like a bunch of idiots and imbeciles if it was not true. And people look at us and laugh and say, man, man, I feel sorry for those people. I feel sorry for him. I feel sorry for her. But look at number four. The certainty that Christ has come back from the grave. You have got to be dead sure and certain that you believe in that resurrection. Because when it comes right down to it, your salvation depends on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you really truly believe that he actually died on the cross? You know, a lot of people say that he didn't die on the cross. He was just kind of like in a coma, in a stupor, just kind of passed out. And when they put him in the grave, the cool grave revived him, and he got out on his own and went on his merry way. I mean, that's being preached and talked today. Can you imagine that? <coughs> but he died on the cross. He just passed out. And they put him in a cool, cool tomb, and that revived him. Then he woke up. He checked out. That's being taught today. I saw it on TV. How many of you watching the preaching on, on Resurrection Sunday? I saw several programs talking that, teaching it. <coughs> People believe it. They don't believe he died on the cross. But if you don't believe that he died, and then if you don't believe that he rose again, you're not saved. It's just plain and simple. See, he says right now, your faith depends on the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why this chapter is so important because it goes with all the gospel messages you study in all the other books of the Bible. It's going to stem right around 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You can't get away from it. See, even in the salvation message in Romans chapter 10, <laughs> verses 9 and 10, that if I shall believe that God had raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you don't believe it, you ain't going to be saved. There's no separating. That's why there's so much emphasis being we need to put on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you, you got you got to have that assurance. And you got you know you got to believe that. Has anybody got any questions on what we just read on that, that sheet of paper? The four elements that you have to believe in. All right, what is the first element we need to believe in? What is it? The death. the death. What is the second element? The death. That he was actually buried. What's the third element? The resurrection. That he rose. All right, what's the fourth element? The testimony. They say we weren't there, you know. So how do we know? By the eyewitnesses, right in the account, Paul wrote down the eyewitness of accounts of people that actually saw him, talked to him, touched him, fellowship with him, eat with him, and at last, they saw him physically, bodily, visibly ascend to heaven. 
That's in Acts chapter 1. They saw him go. And what does the Bible say when he comes back? What's going to happen? In Revelation, what does it say? All right, they saw him leave. What does it say in Revelation? Every eye shall see him coming back. See, the second return of Christ is in two parts. A lot of people don't believe that. A lot of people don't believe in the rapture of the church. It's going to happen. It's going to take place. They don't believe that. A lot of people preaching, teaching that today. There's going to be no rapture. You know? But the Bible says that he's coming back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And when he comes back that time, all eyes are not going to see him. Only the saved, born again people are see, they'll hear the trumpet. When we rise, we'll see Jesus and he'll take us to heaven. That's called the rapture of the church. That's going to last. We'll be there seven years while the tribulation period is going to set in. When the church is raptured out, the tribulation is going to set in. It's going to last seven years. And then at the end of seven years, Christ is coming back in Revelation chapter 19. This first time he came as Savior. The second time, how is he coming back? First time he came as Savior. The next time he comes back in the Revelation, how is he coming? Judge. As judge. He's coming back as a judge, not as a Savior. He's coming back to judge. Judge this world and the people in it. So the first time he came as a Savior, the second time he's coming as a judge. And when he comes back that second time, everybody that's here on the face of the earth will see him coming. And what else are they going to see? If they're not only going to see him, who else are they going to see? Who? Lucifer. No. He's going to see us. See, we're coming back with him. And we're going to be riding on white horses, dressed in white robes. Look at Revelation chapter 19. He's going to be leading the army out of heaven. He's going to be dressed in his warrior clothes as the judge of this world. And all the saints will be coming back with him. We're going to be coming back. We're all dressed in white robes, riding on white horses. And the world's going to see that. Can you imagine if you're lost and undone and the church has been taken out of here and you're here on this earth and all of a sudden, you know, you look up in the sky, you know, you see these comments and medias and all kind of things going on and people just so amazed and the astronomers are studying. <laughs> but one day you think about what they're going to see. They ain't going to need no astronomer that day. They ain't going to need no telescope. He said, he's going to be coming out of heaven and we're going to be riding with him. Multitudes and multitudes and millions and millions coming back with him. And every eye on earth is going to see that. Can you imagine? You here on earth and you look up and you see that coming. You see him coming as your judge. And all the saints coming with him. You know, your mind can't even fathom that. And you try to witness the people tell them what's going to happen. They'll laugh at you. They'll mock at you. They'll scoff at it. Make fun of it. It's so sad. How many of you know it's harder and harder to, to witness now? It's harder to witness to people because their hearts are so cold and got so hard. And the way the world is today, the way the churches have turned, gone apostate almost, teaching false doctrines, false religions. People just, a lot of people not subjected to the true gospel. You know, it's so sad. Think about this. There's a lot of people who's never heard the true gospel. It may be somebody right here in Henderson that has never really heard the true gospel. <laughs> they may have heard preaching, they may have heard teaching and message, but is it the true gospel? See, that's why Paul says we stand on what we believe. We stand on this gospel. And it all relates to the resurrection. So, see, that's why we know we're right. Because the Bible backs it up. It gives evidence. We have eyewitnesses. And we, we believe this. We, we heard it. We believed it. And we received it. So that's how we stand on what we believe while we preach and teach what we do. And that's why it's so important to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ because there's so many people that's never heard the true gospel. You know, my short testimony was when I, I was raised in a Baptist church, but it was liberal at that time because I didn't know anything about what liberalism was. I'll tell you the church, it was New Sandy Creek Baptist Church, one of the greatest churches in Vance County. Preach and teach the gospel. Back then they did Back in the 40s and 50s, it was liberal, which I know nothing about it. 
And we were told when you get 12 years old, you join the church. So they had a summer revival, and all the kids were told anybody 12 and older go down and join the church. So it was about 15 of us. Then at that age, <laughs> we all went down, the preacher set us on the front row there, and he come back down the line. He said, you want to join the church? I said, yes, sir. He said, sit right here. You want to join the church? Yep, sit right here. That's all we were asked. Do you want to join the church? <laughs> yeah, we joined the church. <clears throat> baptized in Wells Mill Pond down there on the uh, Wells Mill Road. <laughs> many, many, many years ago, we baptized in that pond. We had a big baptismal service. And from that day, from when I was 12 years old until I turned, one week before I turned 28, I heard the gospel and got saved. But between age 12 and 28, I never heard the gospel. You know what the gospel was? Anybody witness to me? You know what I tell them? What a lot of people say today. I joined the church. I've been baptized. Have you ever talked to anybody like that? Have you ever asked anybody to say, yeah, I belong to so-and-so church. I'm a church member. I've been baptized. See, that's what I heard. That's what I believed. And that's what I lived on. See, only by the grace of God, he, he allowed me to live long enough to hear the gospel preach. And the first night I heard the gospel preach, it scared me to death. I didn't know, I didn't understand it. I didn't know what was going on. The Holy Spirit got a hold of my heart. And I didn't know what it was all about. I was terrified. But I didn't go, I didn't go down to the front and get saved. And I told my wife when we left that Shannon, that was a, a bit of Grace, background. So I didn't go. I went home. <coughs> but the Holy Spirit wouldn't let me alone. I mean, I was scared. I mean, I actually got to cry and it scared me so bad. I didn't, I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know what was going on. Never heard nothing like that in my life. All the man done was preach what we're talking about right now, preach the gospel. Tell him that you're a sinner and you're going to die and go to hell. What's going to happen? Hmm. Anyway, I went home. I didn't do anything about it, but I couldn't sleep. Got the next morning, went to work. Holy Spirit kept dealing with me all day. It's on my mind. I couldn't get that out of my mind. Because that night we left that church, I told my wife, the kid's mama, I said, I ain't never going back up at that church. That's what I did. I said, I ain't never going back up there. I'm not going back there. Well, what do you think I went to next night? <laughs> the Holy Spirit kept dealing with me so strong. I went on. I told her, I said, let's go back one more time. <laughs> See, that's all it took. The Holy Spirit continued to deal with me. And that night, I just finally realized, hey, you know, you got to do something. You got to do something. And I got up and went down. I didn't understand nothing. I didn't know what I was doing. I knew I had to do something. So I got up and went down, that down, prayed, and they prayed with me. And that night, I was saved, born again, Christ coming to my heart. So I was going to a church. They didn't preach the gospel. They didn't preach what we're talking about right here. They don't preach sin. How many churches you know today has got a big ministry going? Do they preach on sin, being saved, born again? No. We got one of the biggest churches in this country. I think the other day they said he had about 48,000 members. 48,000 people packing there every week. <clears throat> Feel good about yourself. Do the best you can. Help everybody you can. 48,000. Sitting under that man's voice. And just smile on the way and tell them, feel good about yourself. Do good. Live good. You can pull it up on YouTube sometimes and watch him, but it'll... <laughs> I don't know how to make you feel. I watched him the other day. And Lord, have mercy. Oh, I leave that to the other preachers. I leave that part of it for my salvation. He's got 48,000 people sitting there in front of him, and I'm going to leave the salvation message to the other preachers in the other church. What is this 48,000 people doing? Where are they going? What are they hearing? See, that's where we're living, folks. That's where we are at. And this town's got churches the same way. They don't preach the gospel. Feel good, health, wealth, and prosperity. Uh -huh. Saw one that, a couple of programs I watched on Sunday morning that had one in between that. When they had prayer, you know what he done? Everybody wants to have prayer for prosperity to stand over here. Uh 
Mm-hmm. Everybody wants to be sick and healed, you stand over here. Honestly. Prosperity, if you want to be well, stand over here. You want to be well and sick, stand over here. Mm-hmm. Different prayers for different things. Mm-hmm. And then there's something else, I forget what the other one was. But mate, that floor me. When, when do you divide up prayer time? This group for this prayer and this group for that prayer, but there's nothing all combined together for the gospel. Health, wealth, and prosperity. Mm-hmm. It's not God's will that you be sick. It's God's will that you have whatever you want. Ask anything in Jesus' name, he'll give it to you. Name it and claim it. But it's never no gospel. There's nothing to break your heart. See, and that's why we're trying to study in this Sunday school. We got to have the gospel. And we go ahead and knock on doors. But let me tell you how you can move out of Wall House and get you a big house over the country club. I'm gonna tell you how God can bless you. You know, He's gonna give you this and give you that. What kind of message is that? Go to somebody's house and they're sick. Well, you shouldn't be sick. God don't, He's not pleased with you being sick. God didn't have anything to do with that. God didn't cause you to be sick. You need prayers, God, to heal you. We're going to lay hands on you, and you're going to be healed. That's right. And you're not going to be sick anymore. But anyway, let's study and be equipped and be prepared to give the true gospel. Like Paul said, he said, I preached it. You believed it, and now you stand on it. So we're going to go ahead and close that here in just a minute. But we're going to continue our study, keep the study notes, and please read chapter 15. We're going to start reading with verse uh, 20 next week. And read down, you got your sheet where it breaks it down. What's the third section? The third one says, it's the resurrection of the dead. No, that's the second. It's the uh, last enemy destroyed, which is death. See, that's the enemy that's going to be destroyed. It's death, the last one. And we're going to look at that part of it. Because, see, they, they would still feel like I said, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They believed that the body was evil. When it died, it just wait, rotted away. God don't want your body because it's evil. All spiritual stuff. But anyway, anybody got any questions on what we've talked about this morning? Any questions at all? No question is too simple. And nobody's going to laugh at it or mock at it. If you got a question, you need an answer, no matter how simple it may seem. Never fear about asking a question because if you got a question, you need an answer. And if we can't answer it, I'll tell you, I, I don't know, and I'll, we'll get it next week. And I'm not going to give you an answer off the wall. Okay? It ain't, it ain't a question. You know, just God's really good. Say what? God is really good. Yes, he is. Yes, he's, he's better to us than we deserve, that's for sure. Like, we had a man in our church. Mr. Brother Marsh, a lot of you know him. He's dead and gone on now. But you all ask him, Brother Mars, how you doing today? You know what he would always say? You remember what you came and what he would say? Better than I deserve. He'd always say, better than I deserve. That was his favorite saying. He said, better than I deserve. We all doing better than we deserve. We don't deserve anything. It's all by the grace of God. So Paul said right here in these scriptures, by the grace of God, I am what I am. We didn't have anything to do with it, folks. It's all God. Bless his holy name. All right, let's go ahead and pray. We're going to close out. And I'm going to ask my pastor if he will to close us out in prayer. Dear most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this privilege to be able to sit and hear the gospel. Lord, and just uh, thank you so much for what you have done in our lives yes, and what Jesus. you have done through this ministry, Lord. We just uh, we <clears throat> praise you now. Lord, we just pray that this will be used to go out and and just grow the kingdom and teach us and, and get us ready, Lord, to be able to, to know how to present the gospel. And we also ask that uh, you would uh, prick hearts and you would just uh, have everybody uh, minds right and comfort for the service next door that, that if it's a lost soul watching or sitting in this building, Lord, that's never called you. Yes, Lord, we pray that today will be the day of a new life. We just thank you and praise you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Just want to say, appreciate y'all coming this morning. We'll come back next week. Look around the ones that are not here. Let's call.